another thing that further divides the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church is in the Catholic Church, we don't believe that women can be sacramentally ordained. So the Catholic Church understands deaconesses in the Bible and in the early church to be a non-sacramental role, even though there was laying on of hands, even though there is an invocation of the Holy Spirit, even though there are certain prayers that were very similar to the prayers for a deacon, we would still say, but fundamentally, we're going to see this as distinct from um, the sacramental character that a deacon receives, a male deacon receives upon ordination. Um, oddly enough, however, it, it seems that the Eastern Orthodox, beginning with the Alexandrian Patriarchate, are starting to ordain deaconesses. Now, we saw a few years ago, the Patriarch of Alexandria ordained like six deaconesses. But there was a question of, okay, is this a sacramental um, role? Is this a non-sacramental diaconate? What, what exactly is this? Well, we got an answer because Eastern Orthodoxy within the Patriarchate of Alexandria um, sees an introduction of another deaconess, Deaconess Angelic. Um, and it's very clear in this particular case in uh, the church, Orthodox Church in Zimbabwe, that the bishop who did this within the Patriarchate of Alexandria, it's very clear this is a sacramental um, ordination because she does everything that a male deacon does. And it's the exact ordination ceremony of a male deacon so if a male deacon is sacramentally a deacon it's going to be the exact same thing for a female deaconess in eastern orthodoxy because it's not like they're saying no it's the same prayer but we're making a distinction or something there's none of that she's doing exactly what a male deacon does and it's exactly the same ordination ceremony that a male deacon undergoes so this is going to be a massive, I think, plot twist because if they now have are starting to introduce female deacons and they believe they're sacramental, how are we going to have reunion with the Orthodox when we can't agree on the basics of the sacraments of holy orders? That then might introduce later on down the road female priests and maybe even female bishops in Eastern Orthodoxy. Not anytime soon. I don't suspect anytime soon, but maybe a hundred years from now, you might start to see that because if deaconesses can be sacramentally ordained, what is to stop them from saying priests can be sacramentally ordained and priests can be females and bishops can be females and it's all sacramental in nature. So it's kind of the way that the Anglicans ended up going. We're starting to see that with orthodoxy. I think it's going to, the Anglicans went there quickly. I don't think you're going to see it quickly with Eastern Orthodoxy. I think it'll take time, 50, 100 years from now, but you're going to see this conforming more to modernity in Eastern Orthodoxy. Whereas in Catholicism, we have some guardrails. It's infallibly taught women cannot be priests in ordinatio sacerdotalis. That's not going away. That's infallible. So any kind of diaconate that we're talking about for women uh, is also likely not going to be considered um, sacramental in nature. Um, okay, so here's the proof for that, because my the big question that I had is, is this considered sacramental within the Patriarchate of Alexandria? Um, I didn't have an answer until now. Public Orthodoxy just posted this. On Holy Thursday, May 2nd, 2024, Angelic Molin, uh, pronounced Angelic, was ordained to the diaconate in Zimbabwe. The Orthodox Church in Zimbabwe is part of the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate of Alexandria, which Moscow currently doesn't recognize. Moscow says that Alexandria is in schism. Alexandria and all Africa, with the approval and support of the Alexandrian Synod and his Beatitude Patriarch uh, Theodorus, His Eminence Metropolitan Seraphim of Zimbabwe laid hands on Deaconess Angelic in St. Nectarius Mission Parish at Waterfall. So this is within the Alexandrian Patriarchate. Um, it's not, you know, Moscow. It's not Bulgaria. It's 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 specifically within the Alexandrian Patriarchate. And we've seen him, that is the Patriarch of Alexandria, ordain some. And now we're seeing somebody within his Patriarchate, Metropolitan Seraphim, ordaining Deaconess Angelic, which he then makes also Archdeaconess Angelic. And then the question is, okay, is it sacramental or not? Here's the answer. 
It was my blessing and honor to witness and celebrate the ordination along with my oldest daughter and shouts of axia. Normally they say axios. He is worthy upon woman one's ordination. Since she's a woman, they say axia. Here I will offer the details of the ordination. Deaconess Angelic is respected, central and beloved member of Orthodox community of St. Nectarius Mission Parish, and she has been doing diaconal ministry for over a decade prior to this ordination. She first came to the Orthodox Church with a friend when she was 11, and shortly thereafter, her entire family converted. From that early age, Deaconess Angelic has been deeply involved in the pastoral care of the people of St. Nectarius. She oversees many initiatives, including organizing and maintaining a chicken raising program that provides chickens and eggs for members of the community in need. That's pretty cool. Overseeing and teaching catechesis, organizing mothers groups, and representing the Zimbabwean Orthodox Church at an ecological and ecumenical events, including the World Council of Churches and Faith Leaders Environmental Advocacy Training. This is because, again, within Eastern Orthodoxy, especially in communion with, with Patriarch Bartholomew, there's a big emphasis on ecology and the environment, much like you find with Pope Francis. She is working towards a degree in geography and environmental studies at the U University of Zimbabwe. Prior to the ordination, she went through a training and preparation process with formal prayers and instruction from Metropolitan Seraphim. The ordination took place on May 2nd at St. Nectar Nectarius Parish. St. Nectarius is a growing parish of more than 200 souls, more than half of which are children. The parish property includes a church, a school, a church office, a kitchen, and ample playground equipment and room for the children. Men and women children attended the or I'm sorry, ordination. But few were men because the morning service conflicted with the workday. The service began with a choir in front of the church alongside the reader's stand. Throughout the service, little children trickled up to the front to lean on and hold hands with their mothers in the choir. The children throughout the church laughed, keened, sang, and shuffled throughout the service. These are the mellifluous noises of a vibrant parish. Both altar boys and altar girls served that morning. Yes, within parts of Eastern Orthodoxy, you have female altar service. Just before the Divine Liturgy on May 2nd, Metropolitan Seraphim tonsured Deaconess Angelic as a reader and a subdeaconess immediately after, which was the ordination itself, took place as ordinations do during the liturgy at the altar. Here's the key. The ordination service was the rite used for deacons, so it's the exact same rite that is used for deacons, and it specifically tells us which service book, so we can actually go and read it. I have an electronic copy, a physical copy, we can go and look and read through it. The service book of the Holy Orthodox Catholic Apostolic Church published by the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of North America in 1918 based on the Isabel Florence Hapgood translation from the 1906 of mostly Church Slavonic sources. So it tells us specifically which ordination service, what prayers were said, it is absolutely identical to the exact same one of male deacons, and it's sacramental. It's sacramental. It's holy orders in orthodoxy. So they're going to consider it sacramental. In the Catholic Church, we don't consider this service to be sacramental because we would say you can't sacramentally ordain females to the diaconate. We would say that you can have a non-sacramental um, ordination to the diaconate, much like we see in the early church. Um, in, in the apostolic period, in the Bible, you have deaconesses mentioned, but we understand that to be non-sacramental. Um, we had female deaconesses, well, almost into the second millennium in the Roman Rite, but it was generally considered to be non-sacramental in nature. Um, so the way the Catholic Church would understand this would be, these aren't sacramental ordinations. However, Alexandria, and specifically this metropolitan and its patriarch, consider this to be sacramental. Now, you're going to find Orthodox who say, oh, no, we don't accept this. This isn't sacramental. We don't accept it at all. We think this is woke. We think it's modernism. We think it's wrong. You'll find Orthodox who are divided on this issue. So not all Orthodox believe the same thing. Um, but this is going to be a problem because now you're starting to have Orthodox who do this. And now that the door's open and one synod has done it, you're going to start to see other synods doing it in orthodoxy. The English service book is widely used across orthodox jurisdictions in the United States. Metropolitan Seraphim chose to use this rite instead of an extant rite. 
for the ordination of a deaconess from the ancient world in the Barberini Codex. So there, there are other services that you can find in the first millennium for deaconesses. Again, there's a debate on whether or not they're sacramental or not. It seems that Alexandria thinks that they are sacramental. But instead of using some of these other ones from the first millennium, they're just using the current one that is currently used right now for male deacons. And it's because this is the right use for deacons today. This was the natural choice. The only changes made were the masculine pronouns to feminine. So anything in the service that describes, you know, he, it's changed to she. And an addition of reference to St. Phoebe, the woman in St. Paul's letter to the Romans that the church understands to be a prototype for the office of deaconess. That's that reference in the New Testament um, to deaconesses. During the Divine Liturgy on May 2nd, Deaconess Angelic read petitions, read the gospel. This is what a deacon does. They read the litanies, the, uh, read the gospel. Sometimes they preach. Um, and then they also uh, distribute Holy Communion. And she also distributed communion to the faithful. We have plenty of pictures of her doing that. Men and women and children. All liturgical roles shared with the deacon. In fact, she participated in these liturgical actions alongside her brother, who has recently ordained Deacon Spiridon. Having spent time with Deaconess Angelic prior to the ordination, I found her to be humble and soft-spoken. She wore the same vestments as a deacon, modified to spit, uh, fit her smaller frame, at the end of the Divine Liturgy, the Metropolitan spoke of the importance of deaconesses, uh, deacon and angelics, um, deaconess angelics ministry and stressed that she must be an upright example for all, living life in the light of Christ. He invited everyone to come forward and congratulate the new deaconess, which they did. The sense of contained excitement that has been growing during the ordination now bursts forth. The women of St. Nectaria sang, danced, clapped, and ululated while everyone swarmed Deaconess Angelic with affection, pride, and affirmation. Uh, Deaconess Angelic was in demand after the service. Everyone wanted to talk to her. Because Deaconess Angelic is the first deaconess of our time, um, not, not exactly. There was six other deacons that the Metropolitan, Metropolitan had ordained just a few years ago, so I... I don't know where that's coming from. Metropolitan Seraphim elevated her to the rank of Archdeaconess on May 4th at the temporal parish of Panagia of Kikos on the outskirts of Harare using the relevant prayers in the service book of Holy Orthodox Catholic Apostolic Church. So she's not only a deaconess, she's an archdeaconess. She was given the name Phoebe in honor of the first century saint and thus has the title Archdeaconess Angelic Phoebe. But it seems that she will be called Deaconess Angelic or Sister Angelic. After the prayers for her elevation, she assisted the Metropolitan with baptism of the parish children, a traditional role of the ancient world deaconesses. We do see in the early church women participating, women deacons participating in baptisms for females because they were usually done in the nude. So it's kind of inappropriate for a male to baptize a woman in the nude. So usually a woman would do the baptism um, or assist in the baptism um, whenever the bishop or the priest did it. Um, now, again, was that considered sacramental or not? The Catholic Church says no. At this temporal parish, Deaconess Angelic was treated with respect and admiration. And again, many sought to have their photo taken with her. Um, the ordination of Deaconess Angelic was the culmination of worldwide efforts to renew the ancient order of deaconesses in the Orthodox Church. This isn't out of nowhere. It's going to give you kind of a short history. Orthodoxy has been trying to revive deaconesses in Orthodoxy. We're now seeing it with Alexandria. You will see other synods. You, see, you will see Orthodox churches do it. And then you'll see some who don't. Another internal division within orthodoxy. Bolstered by specific efforts within the Alexandrian Patriarchate. Ample evidence testifies to the deaconesses in the ancient world. We all agree on that. It's just, again, whether or not they're sacramental or not is the question. Including scripture, canon, law, correspondence, and archaeological epithets and ordination rites. The office of deaconess is the Christian in the Christian East fell out of use in the late Byzantine era for a variety of reasons, as did the office of deacon. 
So kind of like with the Roman Rite, there was <clears throat> kind of a falling away of the diaconate. You would have it as a transitional thing, but a permanent diaconate, well, Orthodoxy, you know, the Eastern churches have kind of had the same struggle, uh, who became little more than liturgical assistants. The Orthodox Church worldwide has been asking for the restoration of deaconesses for years, including the Inner Orthodox Roads Consultation in 1988 and statements from the Ecumenical Patriarchate, that's, that's Constantinople, in 2020. Many conferences and events dedicated to the restoration of deaconesses have taken place, including those sponsored by a nonprofit formed in 2013 to educate and advocate for deaconesses, the St. Phoebe Center for the Deaconesses, of which I am currently chair. The Holy Synod of Alexandria followed an orderly process of discernment on the restoration of this ordained order. Inspired by many calls for deaconesses, including the Rhodes Consultation, in 2016, the Synod unanimously voted to begin the process. Listen to this. Partly motivated by the affirmation in documents from the Holy and Great Council of Crete in 2016. Let me stop there. That's a mic drop moment. You remember 2016? The Holy and Great Council, it took over a hundred years for Orthodoxy to call this council because they have such an inability to get together in the same room to have a discussion. They've been calling for it for over a hundred years for them to all come down, sit together, and kind of have a council. It didn't really pan out well because Moscow sabotaged it. And along with it no longer participating. Some others didn't participate. So some of the Orthodox participated in the council that took over 100 years to call. At the Right at the end, Moscow pulls out as well as a few others. So when the council actually assembled, you didn't have representatives from all of Orthodoxy. So a lot of Orthodox say, ah, this isn't, you know, this isn't authoritative in nature. And there is a debate in Orthodoxy on what actually is authoritative as far as a council. But some said, ah, this isn't authoritative. Constantinople said, oh, this thing is ecumenical. <laughs> I actually remember seeing a, a representative from Constantinople calling it ecumenical. So some are saying it's an ecumenical council. Some are saying, no, it's not. It's just a pan-Orthodox synod. Some are saying, no, it's none of the above. Some are saying it's authoritative. Some are saying it's not. It's a huge mess, but there hasn't been a whole lot of results from the 2016 council, regardless of what you think about it, except for this. <laughs> and this isn't what I expected. Evidently, Alexandria is saying, hey, we're going ahead with women deacons, and we're attributing that in part to the 2016 Holy and Great Council in Crete. <laughs> um, again, Moscow doesn't recognize it because it's a project of Constantinople and they're usually at odds with them. And it raises questions like who can call a pan-Orthodox synod? What is a pan-Orthodox synod? Is it authoritative? Is it not? Is it not? Who, who needs to be there to represent a church? Is it just a, a representative? Is it just the head of the synod? Or is it, you know, every bishop in the world has to be present? There's huge debates here. Um, so this is one of the problems of Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology is just determining what a pan-Orthodox synod is and then even having one. Well, they're giving a reference to 2016 to say, in part, we're doing this because 2016, um, oh, Holy and Great Council in Crete. I thought that was, <laughs> I thought that was interesting. By the affirmation of documents from the Holy and Great Council of Crete in 2016 of the ability of autocephalous or local Orthodox churches, such as the Alexandrian Patriarchate, to minister to local needs. So they're saying, look, 2016 says we have our ability to minister to our own local needs, which why did you even need a council to say that? I, I didn't know that was in question. Uh, but it, evidently they needed to reassert that. Maybe there were some putting that into question. Um, but they reasserted it and they're saying, see, okay, well, we have a need for women deacons. So we're going to bring them back. By the way, I want to remind you all, hit that like button and hit the subscribe button. If you're new to this channel or you've been around and you've been enjoying the content here, hit that subscribe button. And also check out my book right here, 
answering orthodoxy where I have responded to all of the main arguments that Eastern Orthodoxy use against the Catholic Church. Check it out right here. I especially cover issues like where in the early church and where the Orthodox have their councils actually affirming the papacy. So they're being inconsistent in rejecting the papacy. So check that out. All right. So it says this is an important point because the office of deaconess is part of the Orthodox tradition, has never been a ban has never been banned and is not a doctrinal issue, but a pastoral one. See, I would say no, 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 no. This isn't just a pastoral issue. It would be just pastoral if this were a non-sacramental diaconate. But since it appears to be by all the evidence sacramental how do i know that because it's the exact same ordination ceremony for a male deacon and she's doing everything that a male deacon does there if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck i mean it's a duck right if it does everything that a sacramental deacon does it's a distinction without a difference to say it's not sacramental so it clearly is sacramental um so it's not just an issue of pastoral. It's it's doctrinal. And there's going to be some Orthodox who say, we don't believe that there can be this kind of women deacon. And so it's going to be a doctrinal controversy in Orthodoxy. But not only that, it's going to be an ecumenical issue because we in the Catholic Church don't accept uh, the sacramentally ordained female deacons. We don't believe that that's possible. Pope Francis just recently reiterated it. I mean, look, maybe y'all didn't see this, but let me remind you, this is what Pope Francis just recently said. For a little girl growing up Catholic today, will she ever participate as a clergy member in the church? No. He shut that down. So again, Pope Francis has just said explicitly, no. Um, and there's nothing in the Catholic Church that would indicate that the concept of deaconesses in the early church was sacramental. Um, so the Catholic position is going to be this isn't sacramental. Now, maybe we can talk about deaconesses that are not sacramental, and that would be a pastoral and prudential judgment. But this is more than that on part of Alexandria at this point, because it is clearly sacramental in nature. Unless they're saying that no deacon is sacramentally ordained. And at that point, that's still a doctrinal issue because in Catholicism, deacons, priests, and bishops are sacramentally ordained. Um, so this is very much a doctrinal issue. I don't agree at all with the person who wrote uh, this article. I, th I think that that's going to be an obstacle for Catholic and Orthodox reunion. I mean, how do we negotiate reunions when we can't? get basics together we, we can't we're not on the same page when it comes to the sacraments now believe me there's plenty of other issues that we still have to work through i mean orthodox are still in some places rebaptizing people who are badly baptized that's an issue we settled in like the third century fourth century in the catholic church they're still struggling with that one because they don't have a magisterium so there's plenty of other hurdles we have to get over but this is just another one so in addition to Moscow not recognizing Bulgaria um, and further deepening divisions within orthodoxy. There's now this doctrinal issue. How is this going to work? It, it's it's kind of like with Anglicanism, with their women priests and women bishops, that just makes it so much harder for us to ever talk about reunion with the Anglicans. We're starting to see that within Eastern Orthodoxy, but I will reiterate, I think it will take place slower. Modernizing within Orthodoxy is slower because it is less centralized, but because it doesn't have an actual magisterium at the end of the, the end of the day that can definitively shut these things down and shut these discussions down definitively in the way we did, for instance, with the Immaculate Conception. Because Orthodoxy doesn't have that, it will eventually succumb to the spirit of the age. It will take longer, though. Much, much um, slower than the Anglicans went. 
So it's never been banned, they say, and it is not a doctrinal issue. I don't agree with that. It is well within the purview of a local Orthodox church to ordain deaconesses based on the needs of its flock. Initially, and under threat of financial consequences for the Orthodox Church in Africa, women were consecrated. But they say not ordained by Patriarch Theodorus II. Well, okay, what's the evidence of that? Did he use some kind of different ceremony? Did he make that explicitly known? I still have a big question mark on that. But since I'm seeing what seems to be, in their mind, sacramental ordinations within Alexandria, I would say, why aren't these other ones considered that? Was it different? This was seen as a compromise as the historical order itself was clearly an ordained role. So they're arguing historically deaconesses were actually the, actually sacramentally ordained. Again, there's going to be a lot of Catholics who don't agree. There's going to be a lot of Orthodox who don't agree. There's going to be Eastern, I'm sorry, Oriental Orthodox who don't agree with this. That's also going to impact Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox relations. The ordination of deaconess angelic took place with the explicit blessing of Patriarch Theodorus II and with the full support of St. Nectarius' mission clergy and faithful and with the faith and confidence of Metropolitan Seraphim. Because Deaconess Angelic's ordination is first, it will likely prompt the clergy in Africa to consider standardizing the vetting and training of future deaconesses. There are already plans in place to ordain other women to the diaconate in Harare. So they they got more plan, uh, planned here. More coming. And they're going to serve at St. Nectarius and at nearby parishes. The significance of the location and the day were clear. St. Nectarius um, of Angina, Greece, ordained two nuns as deaconesses in the early 20th century. And Metropolitan Seraphim said that this was an important example for him. The liturgy on Holy Thursday commemorates. By the way, I didn't know that about Nectarius. The liturgy of Holy Thursday commemorates the institution of the Holy Eucharist and so on. Um, Deacon Deaconess Angelic will naturally continue the ministries in which she already is engaged, catechesis and so on. What effect will her, or her ordination have on other parts of Africa or the Orthodox Church around the world? It remains to be seen. But a powerful precedent has been established with the courage of Metropolitan Seraphim and the Alexandrian Patriarchate. Not only was a deaconess ordained, but the process happened in an impeccable manner. The ordination of Deaconess Angelic offers a sound precedent of good church order for other bishops in Africa to emulate, as well as other Orthodox synods around the world to consider. A bishop in America recently told me, this is an Orthodox bishop who said, someone needs to break the ice. Meaning that if one synod went ahead and bore the brunt of being the first group to take action on this issue, then other synods could and would follow. That's true. Now that they've broken that ice, you're going to see other synods and other bishops and other patriarchates doing this within orthodoxy. Now, remember, in orthodoxy, the question of women to the priesthood is still open, according to some orthodox. Some orthodox are going to say, no, it's closed. Others are going to say it's still open. There's nothing that can really definitively settle that question in orthodoxy. So it's going to be an endless debate. But that's why you have you know, very prominent figures in Eastern Orthodoxy, speaking about the possibility of women being ordained to the priesthood in Orthodoxy. Now that you see this with the diaconate, what will happen? You're likely going to see Orthodoxy over time and in other places have women deacons. What will then happen? The next step will be women to the priesthood. Because if you can sacramentally ordain women to the diaconate, why can't you sacramentally ordain them to the priesthood and then the episcopate? It, it's a legitimate question. It, if you could do this, why not the other grades to holy orders? The ice has been broken in Zimbabwe. It is my prayer that other synods will gather the courage and will ordain deaconesses in their own local churches. Metropolitan Seraphim said the revival of the apostolic tradition of the institution of deaconesses is the mi missionary ministry of our church. No one can stop it because it has as its source the Holy Spirit itself who healed the sick and found the missing. So they're claiming, hey, the Holy Spirit is behind these ordinations and nobody can stop it, whether you like it or not. 
Another important precedent is that Deaconess Angelica is 33 years old, married, and has two children. Now, <clears throat> in Orthodoxy, as well as in the Eastern uh, churches, uh, Eastern Catholic churches, if you are married, you can become sacramentally ordained as a male, by the way, <laughs> only a male, uh, can be sacramentally ordained a deacon or even a priest, not a bishop. And that's by way of discipline. That's a discipline. Um, however, after you've received the sacramental character of ordination, you can't get married after, after that. So if your spouse dies, you can't get married again or something like that. Deaconesses in the ancient world were generally, but not always, unmarried and older, and there are canons that state that the deaconess ought to be older than 40, and in some cases 60. Now, with orthodoxy, they have this a very loose flexibility with many of these canons, and it's kind of up to the local bishop in some cases to determine how rigorous he's going to be in the application of a canon. These and other canons relating to age of ordination have always been understood as guidelines. Again, it's it's not like in the Catholic Church with the Code of Canon Law. You know, the only one who can kind of really bend or even throw out a canon is the Pope, because he's the promulgator of the Code of Canon Law. Um, but other than that, you know, clergy kind of have to stick to what canon law says, unless there's something else that allows for some flexibility. Now, there is some flexibility within canon law, but if there's a clear-cut canon, it's it's not as, there's not as much wiggle room in the Catholic Church as there would be a canon in Eastern Orthodoxy. Many of the canons in Orthodoxy are just dead canons. They don't even apply to today because they were maybe a canon from 1,400 years ago in a different part of the world that doesn't even apply to today. So they don't have the kind of canonical system that we do today. These and other canons relating to the age of ordination have always been understood as guidelines. The canons also state that men should be at least 30 to be ordained as priests, though example abound of younger priests. When asked about the issue of age, Metropolitan Seraphim stressed the ordination is less about the letter of the law and more about the spirit. Again, more wiggle room in orthodoxy when it comes to applications of canons. Maybe in some cases that's a good thing. Maybe in other cases that's a very bad thing. Um, it certainly is going to be less uniformity across the board in orthodoxy. Deaconesses and uh, Deaconess Angelic already has a diaconal ministry and is deemed spiritually prepared and well suited for ordination. So the church ought to ordain her now rather than waiting for her to turn 40. I rejoice in this detail because there are those who wish to see deaconesses in the Orthodox Church but believe they should only be older women and possibly only monastic women. I think that they wrote this before the service. Many of the women doing similar diaconal work elsewhere in the world are also younger and often have families. It makes good sense to ordain these women rather than wait for an arbitrary age. As noted, Deaconess Angelic was ordained with the same prayers on the books as for a deacon, and she is already serving liturgically in the same capacity as her male counterparts, which I want to say, okay, you already have admitted that. You know, the person who is writing this already... You're admitting that. So it's clearly sacramental. It's not just a prudential and pastoral issue. It's a doctrinal one. Even as this is the case, there is no erasure of gender going on. It is very much expected that Deaconess Angelic will bring her feminine perspectives and gifts to the ministry. And it should be noted that the Zimbabwean culture is highly gender bound. Her dignity as a woman is very uh, being honored through ordination, not compromised. Uh, okay. Reactions, as one might imagine, there have been a variety of reactions in the wake of the ordination of Deaconess Angelic. Most reactions are positive, if not overjoyed. In the days of the ordination, I received notes from around the world celebrating the Holy Spirit at work and proclaiming a renewal of hope. Well, that's just one group. There will be plenty of others who claim to be Eastern Orthodox. Whether or not they're in communion with this patriarchate is a different question, but there will be plenty of other Eastern Orthodox who say, no, this is absolute heresy, this is ridiculous, this is not legitimate, These, this is just modernism, 
this is a group of orthodoxy that's going woke. This is liberalism. This is blah, blah, blah. You know, there's going to be orthodox who oppose this. Your ortho bros are going to be, are going to generally be very opposed to this. Your ortho bros online are going to pretend like this isn't happening. They're just going to pretend like it doesn't exist. Or they'll just say, oh, that's not real orthodoxy, which kind of brings us to the true orthodoxy movement where you find many people who have left canonical orthodoxy for true orthodoxy. So they're not in communion with what we would consider to be the Orthodox Church, but they claim to be Orthodox and they kind of have their own schismatic bishops. It's like the Orthodox version of set of a contism. You know, they claim to be Catholic, but they're not in communion with the Catholic Church. Um, well, you're going to have your true Orthodox who claim to be Orthodox, but they're not in communion with the Eastern Orthodox, but they claim to be the real Eastern Orthodox. Um, they're going to say, look, see, this is another example of how world orthodoxy is actually compromising to the spirit of the age. Ergo, we're the true Orthodox. They're not real Orthodox. You're going to have that. This is going to feed more into that group. And I, am, I suspect you're going to start to see many people start to join as we see this more and more prevalent in orthodoxy. You're going to see many people start to join true orthodoxy. A common refrain was that people, women and men, cried when they heard the news. For many orthodox Christians, this news comes with joy, but also some relief. Relief that our community is finally coming to its senses. Other orthodox seem surprised but interested. There are still a lot of people who do not know about the history of the order of deaconesses or the possibility for deaconesses today. Right. There's going to be plenty who say, no, this doesn't apply to today, or this isn't even possible. You can't have a sacramental or um, ordination of women. There's also naysayers. Many of them are vitriolic and aggressive. <laughs> this is unfortunate, but not surprising. And the only thing to be done is pray for their souls. Some naysayers are more respectful, but spread downright incorrect information and opinions. For example, the false claim that women were never ordained to the di diaconate in the ancient world, but only consecrated. The fact that deaconesses were ordained has been clearly established by scholars like Dr. Karras and Dr. Uh, Evangelos Theodoro. Uh, so again, internal debate within orthodoxy and even outside of orthodoxy. Another false claim is that the movement for deaconesses around the world is motivated by concerns for secular feminism. While there is no doubt that the cultural changes of our era bring questions to the church about the role of women, the movement of deaconesses is coming from faithful Orthodox Christians, women and men who build, uh, wish to build a better future for the Orthodox Church. Now, there's going to be plenty of Orthodox who say, no, these aren't faithful Orthodox. They're schismatics and they're heretics and they're liberals and they're woke and they're blah, blah, blah. And they see hope in the possibility of renewing the entire order of the diaconate women and men in the in order for the church to serve its people and the world again i have to say um this is going to be a massive barrier for reunion between catholics and orthodox um and once you've bought into this there's no way to say no to women to the priesthood and women to the episcopate no real way to say no. You might say, well, it doesn't practically work today, but in theory, you could have it. And eventually you will. Because why? The spirit of the age is pushing for it. With that kind of pressure, eventually you're going to have some caving in. We're starting to see Orthodox countries caving into the modern world. We saw Greece recently, even though the Episcopate is opposed to it. We saw Greece recently uh, legalize um, same-sex marriage. So you're starting to see some of these Orthodox countries become more and more secularized. Now, again, you're going to have the Episcopate in some cases opposing it, but what happens when eventually they end up becoming secularized? You don't ultimately have a magisterium that can shut the door on this and say, absolutely no. So eventually there's going to be more and more and more caving in and giving into these things um so this is certainly a cause for concern and it will be interesting to see how other orthodox react to this and how the situation develops again reminding y'all of this book over here 
see how to point to that. Hold on. There we go. <laughs> Answering orthodoxy that I wrote. Uh, certainly check it out. It is on Amazon and it will address many of the objections that Eastern Orthodoxy has against Catholicism. Look at the trolls in the chat doing their best to try to cope with this. Lofton is coping hard. He can't pope explain anymore. Looking bad. So he's now attacking Orthodoxy. You're a perfect example of the very thing that you claim. You're coping with what I'm presenting to you. I presented facts. You couldn't engage the facts. So you had to try to gaslight us by saying, I'm the one coping. That's again called projection. You're the one coping here. Hey friends, are you thinking about converting to Eastern Orthodoxy? If so, I have the book just for you. It's called Answering Orthodoxy. In this book, I engage all of the objections that Eastern Orthodox have against the Catholic Church. I respond to all of them, refute them, and I show why the Catholic Church alone possesses the fullness of the faith. Get your copy today at shop.catholic.com. Hey friends, do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com.